downhill side of a sermon series from Galatians 5 that is uh, where we're sorting out the fruit of the Spirit as Paul describes it in Galatians 5. And uh, I think it might be a good idea for a moment to renew or review his uh, list. Now I'm going to jump ahead to uh, Galatians 5 starting at, um, let me see, I think I'll start at verse 17. If you want to follow along with me, you can find Galatians 5 in your pew Bible on page 1157. And since I'm putting Katrina on the spot, if it's not on the screen, it's okay. Look at her. She is that good. (laughs) She's not only a super mom on Mother's Day, but she's pretty darn good at taking care of things around here. Starting at verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. But I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's the word of God for the people of God. Now, if you weren't here for the previous messages, you may want to reach into that container out there and get notes from the past messages. You can also listen to previous messages and we have uh, information in the newsletter and various other places that will help you find that and you can just ask. But you will remember that we spent a great deal of time talking about what those fruit of the flesh look like in today's uh, context. And so you find that, that we're all uh, given over to the flesh at times and we all have temptation to gratify the flesh. And all that really means is, is that we have a spiritual nature and we have a sort of animal nature and the Lord invites us to elevate ourselves to the spiritual nature and he's created a way by taking Christ as the sacrifice necessary to break down the barrier between us and God and then through through the same Christ we get the Holy Spirit which enables us to live the spiritually pure life that we desire and that's evident in fruit of the Spirit. And we've been looking at each of these various examples of fruit of the Spirit. Today, we look at the spirit of gentleness. And I titled this sermon, Gentle on My Mind. How many of you remember the Glenn Campbell version of that song? It's a fun song. It's a fun song that kind of reminds you that when people love you unconditionally, you're always welcome In their home, you're always welcome to stay as long as you need to, go when you need to. And uh, I'd like to see gentleness exemplified in the life of the church in a similar way, where there's just a kindness that is so evident. But as with each of the characteristics in this series, I have found it difficult to really flesh it out with you without doing a word study. I just, the first thing I've done with each of these fruit is is examine the word that's used to describe the fruit. Now, the first thing you should know, because I have an expensive education and I've got to use it at least once or twice a month, is that the original languages of scripture were the universal languages of their day. 
And so that's why the gospel and all the message of Jesus and the Bible and the relationship with God and humanity, all of that was carried throughout the known world by the universal language of its day. But there's kind of a new universal language in town, at least in the 20th century, and it happens to be the English language. And so throughout the uh, last few hundred years, scholars have been busy trying to translate the original languages of scripture into English, and then here we are today reading the English language version of words that were not used by English-speaking people, but rather people who used the universal language of ancient Greek and uh, sometimes the Roman language that we call Latin, and sometimes in the language of the Old Testament, it's Hebrew and Chaldean. So, so these languages had to be translated forward for our sake into English, and for a time, some of those translations were actually translations of the German translations of the Greek and the Hebrew and everything. So, so all that to say that, that ongoing scholarship is an important part of being a Christian in today's Times And ongoing scholarship gives us archaeological evidence and things like that that help us to better understand what the authors meant when they said these things. And so coming back to the word study, someone translating the oldest existent text of Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia Probably letters that were more like form letters that got penned uh, at the last minute to churches in Galatia, but another one might have been sent to the churches in some other part of the world. But, you know, his ideas were, were meant for all believers throughout the known world. And, and so we're trying to figure out what Paul said and how to say that in English. And sometimes that can be very challenging because it turns out that some of the vocabularies they used in those days have more words for stuff than we have. So this makes it very interesting. Now I'd like to get to the point because this word study in gentleness, this idea that Paul is expressing as a form of fruit of the spirit. If you're living in the spiritual world and becoming more and more like Jesus every day, then what does it mean to be gentle? And the first question I asked myself was, is why do some versions of the Bible use the word meek instead of the word gentle? And do the words, in in the original language, does the word gentle and the word meek mean the same thing? And if so, then how come Jesus said explicitly in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek and not the gentle? So these are the kind of questions you pay me to ask. This is the kind of stuff that my education is supposed to help me with. But when we're really honest about it, any of us who love the Lord are just naturally curious. And I hope that you have generated or seen in yourself generated curiosity about the word of God and the the heart and mind of God as it's expressed through scripture. So here's what I found out. Gentleness and meekness are not the same thing. And it's probably not appropriate to translate Paul's word gentleness to meekness. And I could give you some really hard to pronounce words in Greek, but basically they're two different words in the original language and Jesus used one and Paul used the other. So we really aren't talking about the same quality. And for the sake of our discussion, let's just agree that what Jesus says is meekness is really about one's approach to God. What Jesus says is blessed are the meek because they will inherit the earth And what he really means by that, it's pretty clearly, is is that if you have a humble approach to God, then you're entitled to everything God has in store for you. So you have to approach God with humility. Now, how many times have we talked about that, family? We talk about that all the time, that, that there are all kinds of do's and don'ts that you can try to follow in a legalistic sort of way. There are all kinds of things you can come to church for that don't have much to do with the relationship we have with our Lord. And when it gets right down to it, the surest, fastest way to get right with God is humility or meekness. To say to yourself, honestly, there is a God and it ain't me. To be quite honest about who you are 
in relationship to God is what Jesus means by meekness. There's a humility about you. And to be honest, I would say that meekness is characterized, for example, when I talked about mental health, when someone's willing to admit that they have some need and they work hard to compensate for it and to the extent that they would even partner with people that God has provided to help them. That's meekness. That's strength through humility. And so when Jesus talks about humility and meekness, what he means is is that you're stronger because you can do it. Because you're not too proud to admit that you need the Lord's help. You're strong because you're not willing to surrender to your pride. Pride is this bully that lives inside some of us that won't let us live to the fullest extent that we can because we're so easily embarrassed or shamed. And so it takes great strength to be meek in the way that Jesus intends us to be meek. So humbly submit yourself to the Lord God and admit that without his provision and protection, you're nothing. Whatever success you've had in life, whatever you think you did, whatever you think you accomplished, give the Lord more credit and watch how that changes you. That is the courageous humility that Jesus describes as meekness. Now let's move on to what Paul was talking about, the fruit of the spirit. And as you'll see in a minute, it really ties in beautifully with what Jesus was talking about. So they're not they don't cancel each other out. They just mean two different things. And together, it's a really beautiful picture. Because when Paul talks about gentleness, we're looking at a different word. And that word in English got its origins in the French language and in the word that would best translate as genteel. Genteel. Some of you are well-read and you probably have heard that word used to describe certain types of people. I'm sort of trying to mirror that up here. It's not going very well. But genteel is a sort of sophistication and a sort of, of rank of sophistication. And so it's, it ties into what a lot of societies in Europe would call classism. It has a, it has a sort of connection to that. But that's not what Paul means. That's just how the English translators tried to get at what Paul was telling us. And so if you dig deeper into the etymology of the word, and if you look at my notes, it's all there for you, and I'm not going to read it to you, but, but basically if you dig into it, you begin to realize that, that the English translators are trying as hard as they can to get us to see that what Paul describes as gentleness as a fruit of the Spirit is a kind of characteristic trait that is passed down through the lineage. And so the idea of the genteel is a similar idea, meaning that some people have a certain rank in society because of who they're descended from. And so that's the meaning of the word that Paul is using, and we're trying to figure it out in English, that, that what he wants us to understand is, is that gentleness is a sign that you are descended from greatness, that you're descended from a unique type of person. And so Paul wants you to see this fruit of the spirit of gentleness as a way that you conduct yourself that is an indication of your family of origin, an indication of your rank. But I mean that up against meekness, which is humility, about such things. And so what Paul is describing as gentleness is an inherited quality. So when we talk about being like Jesus, we're getting at what Paul means by gentleness, that we conduct ourselves as though we come from the same neighborhood, from the same household as Jesus. And you know, 
class can be a good thing. It's usually bad, but it can be a good thing because there's a certain sort of shared uh, characteristic that we all aspire to when we all agree about certain things. It's right here in this building right this minute. We all have certain standards that we're living up to because we've had this sort of unspoken agreement about our culture. And so it's one of the reasons why you're politely listening while I talk. It's, it's, it's like the gentleness that Paul is describing. It's a sense that as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of his family and therefore our family, we all have this shared aspiration to be like Jesus and to co- conduct ourselves accordingly. And it turns out that you can't do that without the spirit. And the kids, the fine young people that were in the confirmation retreat this weekend heard all this yesterday. It turns out that the secret to having the gift of gentleness as we've unpacked it now is to be born again. Because it turns out you can't really inherit that quality that is uniquely ascribed to the children of God through Jesus Christ unless you've been born into the family of God through Jesus Christ. And so gentleness is something that's not going to happen until you're born again. And being born again, as many of you now know, is something that starts with the meekness Jesus described about your humility before God, your willingness to admit that you do need a savior. And you need him right now. Your willingness to admit that you can't be holy enough to justify yourself before God. But with Jesus as your justification, you can be holy enough to join the family of God. And so you accept that you are a sinner saved by God's grace. You accept that Jesus is the means of God's grace that saves you. And it is the first step toward being gentle or like the family of God. And so after having accepted that gift of salvation, then you humbly submit yourself to the leadership of Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of what you were about to embark upon, this journey of faith in God. Through Christ, you become like him. And like him is what gentleness means in Paul's description of fruit of the spirit. So what can you do? Well, hopefully you've accepted Christ as your savior. Hopefully you have uh, opened your heart to the Holy Spirit so that you can be born again in the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't, you know, any time you want to come talk to me about it, even after church today, we'd be happy to pray together about such things. But in the meantime, consider this. In the book of Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible, it says that God created humankind in God's own image and that God created them, male and female, and he created them and they were good. In other words, they carried all the traits, the gentleness of the Spirit of God. And it was only sin that took away that attribute. And so by surrendering because of your sin to Christ's grace, he takes away the sin of the world so that you can be born again and carry all the qualities of a child of God filled with God's spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word, truth from your heart and mind. Now burn it upon our hearts for your name's sake, we pray. Amen.